Well, the other day, um, Dr. John and I met with a pastor, a friend of ours, and um, he was really going through it, not him per se, but all the people around him. There were challenges where there were suicides in the family. And then we talked to another pastor friend of ours, and uh, there was a tragic accident with this pastor's sister, and she passed away. And then I've been talking to other people, and we've had some folks going through stuff here, and someone burned his arm, and someone else had an unexpected death, and just different things. And Dr. John, was, we were praying. We, we decided to pray on the phone together. We met with this gentleman, and we prayed for the other uh, pastors who were not with us. And as Dr. John was praying, he said this phrase, the unfolding of God's purpose. And that stuck with me. So today, that's what we're going to be talking about. The unfolding of God's purpose. Don't let the curveballs throw you. That's the other part God gave me. So let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this awesome day that you have blessed us with. I want to thank you, Lord, for ministering life to every person who hears this word in the sound of my voice. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now, I'm talking about curveball. I'm not talking about the Dodgers. I'm not talking about the Yankees or the Mets. I'm talking about that expression, that expression when curveballs get thrown at you. And that, that expression means, a curveball means something unexpected or disruptive, an unpleasant interruption to life that requires attention or correction. We're not talking about egg mid man knocking on your door and saying you won a thousand bucks or something like that. We're talking about the yuck yuck stuff that happens. Have you ever felt like a curveball was thrown at you? And these curveballs come from various sources. Other people, our choices, the world we live in, and they range from simple things. Running late, maybe, and you're absent-minded and you get a speeding ticket. That's pretty simple. Okay? Maybe an overdrawn bank account. Not fun, but kind of simple. A computer crashing right before you need to print something that's important. Ooh, not too fun. That's happened to me before. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Jesus. Or more serious things. A car crash. Losing one's home in a fire or flood. The death of a loved one. A severing of a relationship. A divorce. Or a health issue. I'll tell you more about the health issue at the end, so hang with me on that one. But I want to say this, during those times in our lives when we go through things, especially the serious ones, it's easy to get stuck because we can't get past the why. Why has this happened? Right, why me? Why has this happened? We need to blame someone or something, don't we? And I'm not talking about taking responsibility. There's a time to take responsibility for things. But that word blame, when we're talking about blame, Blame's focus is to find fault, and at its worst, it's judgmental, it's vindictive, and it's against God, it's against others, and it's against ourselves. We get in these ruts where we blame ourselves and we get stuck, and we're so focused inward. We're so focused inward. But you know what, guys? Life is not about how many curveballs you encounter, but rather adjusting your perspective to effectively handle each curve in life. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? But even the disciples who were hanging with Jesus all that time weren't immune to it, were they? Here they were. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5 in the message. They're walking down the street. Jesus saw a man blind from his birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause effect here. Look instead for what God can do. And what's that next word? We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the workday's over. For as long as I'm in the world, there is plenty of light. I am the world's light. How many times like Jesus' disciples were looking for someone to blame? And instead of responding with this heart of love, we make it worse by telling people, it's God's will, or you deserved it, or you did something wrong, or you didn't have enough faith, or whatever it is. But what did Jesus do? He didn't answer why or cast blame. He responded with how he could bring life into the situation. And I found in my life that when I keep going, why, 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 I'm in this place of static, and I'm in this place of unrest, and I don't get answers. And maybe a year or two later, when I'm in a place of peace, that answer will come to me. I'll say, that's what it was. You ever been there, done that? That's what happens to me. But what if we respond how? Look what he said. He said, look, instead, for what God can do, we need to be energetically at work. He didn't say I. He said we. Did you catch that? I never saw that before. We need to be at work. We do. 
In the mirror, it said, this is an opportunity for God's actions to be unveiled in him. Wow. So who's the we? The man receiving and those on the giving end as well. Both. That's the unfolding of God's purpose. In the midst of that stuff, in the midst of the unexpected or disruptive or unpleasant things in life, how are we responding? Every curveball can be an opportunity to see the unfolding of God's purpose. And I'm not saying that God caused the curveball. God doesn't have the illness to give. God doesn't have the yuck yuck to give. It's not God. That's not the point. But like Jesus, I'm saying that those curveballs are opportunities for the unfolding of God's purpose in and through us. God didn't cause the curveball, but he can and does cause all things to work together for good. It may not seem like it, but he can. When I was watching um, America's Got Talent, there was this other gentleman from, I don't know what country, because they had the best of the best from all the countries competing. And this guy came on, and he needed assistance. And I think he, I get confused, but I think he had cerebral palsy, was it? He walked um, kind of crooked, and he couldn't even speak. But he wanted to be a comedian ever since he was little. He didn't let that stop him. He had this particular, wait, am I getting the right? Yeah. He had this particular machine, and in this machine, he could go ahead and program words, and he was a comedian. And as a result of that, he won in another country. Not because people felt sorry for him, but because he was a good comedian. Right. He didn't let the curveball that he encountered stop him from doing what he felt called to do. Now, on the face side, we could say, oh, why wasn't he healed? What happened to him? It's like, stop and shut up. After a while, that's not our, our thing. As far as he's concerned, he's happy. He's doing great. And who on this side of heaven is walking in total, everything's perfect every moment? Nobody. The Bible says man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. There's many of us sometimes walking around with all these heart issues, just as crippled on the inside. But that man seemed crippled on the outside, but he was full of joy. And it was just so refreshing to watch him not be hindered. And how many times have we seen people with the most challenging curveballs thrown at them do more than those of us who claim we're all together? So God can cause it all to work together for good. There's a guy in the Old Testament I know we talked about, and I think Elder Brian talked about him a couple years ago, and we, we commonly refer to Joseph in the Old Testament. And I'm not going to go through all 13 chapters from Genesis 37 through Genesis 50, but he had a gr- curveball thrown at him. And just like him, sometimes we have curveballs thrown at us, and we've got to still go through the situation. Isaiah 43 in the Living says, we go through deep waters. We go through rivers of difficulty. We go through oppression. Why do you think it says we're overcomers? Because we have something to overcome. So what does it mean when we go through the deep waters and great troubles? It means God will support and deliver us when we are in the greatest straits and difficulties of our lives. Are you still here today? Can you right now think of a challenging situation that you've gone through, whether when you were younger or recently, and you are still here? By the grace of God, you are still here. I am still here. Rivers of difficulty, you won't drown. The children of Israel crossing the Red Sea seemed impossible, but they didn't drown. When you walk through oppression, that means to be exposed to all kinds of dangers. Daniel in the lion's den. Well, I like this version even better. The message says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, ever feel that way? I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, that was my dad's expression, when you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God. And that word redeemed, so many times we brush over it. And I said, Dr. John, does it mean something greater? So he gave me this whole page, which was great. And then I surmised what he said at the very end. He said, God is our active relative bringing restoration to us in some ways. Oh, wait, wait, every way. Oh, that's right. He is swift to run and empower the humble. He who is swift toward humility will find God and strength. And he did a letter definition. So read that with me. God is our active relative, bringing restoration to us in every way. He is swift to run and empower the humble. He who is swift toward humility will find God and strength. Wow. So when God says he's redeemed you, honey, he's redeemed you. 
When he says, fear not, that means don't be afraid. Why? Because fear causes us to focus on the situation. And once again, it's all about, are we going to focus on the situation or are we going to rest in God's love for us? Months ago, I showed you a uh, little graph that says we are either moved by love or we're moved by fear. And it's a choice every moment. And I'm not saying that we're not shaken sometimes. I'm just saying to get back on it. And he says, I've called you by name. You're mine. That means we have intimacy with God. That means we have friendship with God. That means we're partners with God. That means he protects us. That means we are like God and he's like us. And the biblical meaning of name is character manifested. Do you really know who you are? And when you do, the purpose of God can flow through you. But we have a choice today. Joseph. Joseph was the second youngest of many brothers. And he was thrown into a pit and slow, sold into slavery by his brothers. You can check it all out in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. He could have become bitter and blamed his father Jacob for giving him a coat in front of his brothers, which caused them to be jealous of him. He could have blamed himself for sharing his dream with his brothers, which made them even more jealous of him. He could have blamed his brothers for throwing him in the pit. He could have become bitter against the chief butler for not remembering him after Joseph interpreted his dream. Because he interpreted his dream, he said, remember me. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I will. And he was, didn't remember him? No, no, no. <laughs> but during all those years, between the time Joseph was 17 or 18, thrown in the pit, and in his mid-50s, that's 40 years, guys, something like 35, 40 years or whatever it is, he gained perspective. He gained maturity. And toward the end, the brothers recognized who he was, and they recognized they treated him badly, and the dad told him to go ahead and say, hey, forgive my sins. And Joseph received their message, and he wept. Then the brothers went in person to him, and they said, we will be your slaves. They recognized what they, were do they had done. Now Joseph had an opportunity. He had a curveball thrown at him. And what did he say? He says, don't be afraid. Do I act for God? Don't you see What's that word next word? You. We didn't say God. So many people think, oh, God did it. No, no, no. You. We have free will, okay? You planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. As you see all around you right now, life for many people. He could have become bitter, but he chose not to. And he says, no, no, no. I am now, God has raised me up, and I have become a deliverer for many, look, for many people. From many people. Thank you, Lord. Curveballs, saints. Curveballs. Last May or June, I chose to go in for my typical mammogram. And then I went in for another one because there was an irregularity in, in the left side. And then as a result of that, I think I have a whole list of things at home, my whole file now. I had a, uh, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it the biopsy or was it the CT scan and all this stuff? I had all these tests done. And as a result of that, I got a diagnosis of stage one breast cancer. Okay. Praise God. We can handle this. And after prayer, well, actually, when I was told, you know, I did my test. Actually, I, let me go backtrack. It was October 29th that I had the biopsy, and I was still a little sore. And here we were at our trunk or treat event. But one of our other members was going through it, and I said nothing. So I was just holding my tongue and believing with them, and praise God. And then on November 9th, I get a call to come in. And you know when you get the call to come in, it's like, dun, dun, dun. And mind y'all, I am the health pastor. I am a healthy person. Amen? So... And I mean that, not just because I'm saying it, but I've been doing this 20, 30 years, and I just partner with God in health, and it's so exciting to me. It's like, woo! And uh, I'm a certified nutrition coach and all that. So I go ahead, and suddenly a fear tries to rise from within. I say, uh, she says, can you come in? I say, oh, uh, maybe later. My husband's asleep, and I hung up quickly. And I went to my happy place, and my happy place for me is where I can feel like I can breathe. So I went on the bike trail. And I didn't stay the whole time because I felt like I was supposed to turn back and give her a call. But I, I was for 10 minutes, I went on there and said, okay, God, what are we going to do about this diagnosis? Wow. And he said, 
clearly to me, if anything offends you, cut it out. Wow. So I went back and I called her and DJ and I went. And then she seemed even more tearful than me. And I find out later she's a, a believer. My nurse practitioner, Christine, is wonderful. And she's just precious. And, um, but to backtrack, God had given me a word that 60 would be my best year. Guess what, saints? I'm 60. Now, he gave me that word before I turned 60. I turned 60 in February. And um, praise God. So on March 6th, I had this surgery. And I had the most wonderful little surgeon I, I guess I picked people who are little because we could see eye to eye. <laughs> My surgeon's only several inches taller than me. Um, and he's awesome. And the first thing he did when he saw me is he said, you're pretty healthy, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. But anyway, we had the surgery. And then not only did they deal with that, but they test the lymph nodes. And to my surprise, they found something in four lymph nodes. They removed those, and they removed 11 lymph nodes besides that. So I'm happy to say as of today, it's a month later, I'm beginning to feel a little better here because you feel numb and things change and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so as a result of that, they upped the stage of what this thing is called. I'm like, wow. And I was doing really well, really well. And then last Saturday, I woke up and another fear tried to grip me. And so when DJ says, how you doing? Well, he didn't say, how you doing like that, but... <laughs> It's on my brain. Sorry, Sal. <laughs> DJ asked me how I was. I felt, I felt shaken for a moment. Yeah, and you know what? He hugged me. We prayed. We talked. We cried. And I got back on it. And it's just a number because nothing has changed. Yeah. But you see, when curveballs are thrown at us, we have to choose not to play the blame game. I was trying to find answers. And with what I'm dealing with and overcoming, because on the other side of heaven, it's all settled, and here it's, the healing is manifesting, there are many answers, and we don't know conclusively. And immediately, the enemy in our mind, or the devil, or whatever you want to call it, tried to challenge me and say, aha, all those years of healthy eating doesn't matter, and, and who's going to ever want you to minister to them on that area again, and blah, blah, blah. And I had to silence all that. I had to resist the urge of blaming myself if I did anything. I went through my checklist. I'm not mad at anyone and blah, blah, blah. And after a while, it's like DJ says, stop. Okay? So choose not to play the blame game, period. Choose not to be bitter. How many times people are bitter instead of embracing life? Joseph had the opportunity. The young man I told you about on America's Got Talent had the opportunity. He didn't. Because if we're not bitter then we can become better. I mean, if someone else said that, I mean, just, yeah. But we can become better. When curveballs are thrown at us, choose to allow God's purpose to be manifest through you. After I got back on it, I thought, you know what? I'm going to be a light to everyone I meet. And when I was at the hospital, I had the most precious nurse. Uh, I think Karen was able to come, Karen and Pastor Christina. We had the most precious nurse. Another little gal we saw eye to eye. God gave me little people, I'm just saying. Queen of the Valley Hospital was awesome. The people were normal people. I see people as people, not just a profession. And I love people. And I was talking to some other people who were doing things with me that knew things. And I'm like, so why do you want to do this? What makes you tick? And I was talking to them. And, you know, as I'm there with no makeup on, oh, which was horrible, and having the hair net, it's like, no makeup, no. The real me. So I just shine from the inside out. So. Um, but it was really neat talking to them. And the nurse, the nurse that was there, it was so neat because she... Um, she had gone through something 20 years earlier and she's on the other side. And I was just choosing to allow God to be manifest through me. And my journey is still continuing. And I'm just saying out loud, I'm choosing to allow God's purposes to be seen in and through me. That's not going to stop me from praying for people for healing. That's not going to stop me from ministering uh, nutrition tips, doing life, ministry, you name it. Amen. Now, that does mean sometimes I may feel led to be on sabbatical to focus on one area at a time. So thank you guys for being gracious. And I want to publicly thank our elders and Pastor Christine and others who have ministered. Um, I was still involved in prayer and counseling others and doing everything else and the minister association and washing my clothes and everything else. But I just wanted to amp up and thank you guys for allowing me to do that. And then choose to rest in God's love. So many people are saying, I'm fighting this. I had the privilege. Marsha, I'm going to tell you something about Marsha in the back. Marsha in the back has the most awesome sister. 
and the most best family and coolest husband. Yeah. And I had the privilege of meeting her sister who had gone through this when she was, let's see, eight years ago. And it was just so cool to meet someone else. And one of the things she said is she wasn't fighting. And so many times if you're on the outside looking at someone who's been diagnosed with something, the temptation is to say, fight. And I understand if you mean fight by casting down fears and stuff, yeah, go for it. But there's no need to fight in a battle that's already been won when we're resting in God and his faith in us. We're resting in his love. There is no fight. I don't have time to fight. I don't have energy to fight. I'm going to use all my energy on the bike trail and to woohoo, praise God, and everything else. So, so I'm encouraging you, if you're going through stuff, choose to rest in God's love. Choose to rest in God's love. Surrender to his love. We were here last week when Dr. John was talking about the Eastern and Western ways of, of looking at things as they look at Jesus. And I am resting in God's love and in his wisdom and walking out the journey, period. And I encourage you guys to do the same thing. Rest in his love. And this one's really important. Say really important. Really important. Choose to share your journey with friends and family instead of going through it alone. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 in the message says, Friends love through all kinds of weather, and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. Ecclesiastes says, Two people are better than one. If one person falls, the other person can reach out to help. Some other scriptures I should refer to. We're not alone. Why don't you close your eyes and receive these right now? God says in Isaiah, Don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear. I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady and keep a firm grip on you. Isaiah 46. Since the day you were born, I've carried you along. I will still be the same when you are old and gray, even if you cover the gray hairs. I'll insert that. And I will take care of you. I created you. I will carry you and always keep you safe. And one more. I'll never, according to Hebrews 13, I'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. God is there, ready to help. I'm fearless no matter what. Who or what can get me? Open your eyes. Do you receive that? Amen. You see, I have something in my phone called declarations. And these are some of them. And Dr. John said, God's been preparing me the whole time to overcome this anyway. He didn't cause this, but he's, he's prepared me. What have I been saying for, I don't know how many months to you? We are not of the quitting kind. We have a persuasion of souls that believes against all odds. So what is rising in you during those times when you feel curveballs are thrown at you? What are you going to do? When we walk in humility, that definition that Dr. John gave us, we will find God and strength. When we walk in that place of humility, and some of you have gone through it. I love my mom dearly, and I'm seeing her go through stuff. But she's going through it. A curveball has been thrown, and she's not giving up. Amen. An unexpected fall in a bathroom. Who would have thunk it? Yeah. But he, Jerry is still here. Yeah. And it's an opportunity for him to receive God's love through his mom. And we pray, Mom, Annie, that you are strengthened in God. Marsha, the most challenging thing to lose a parent who you just adore but they are with us in spirit and you are not alone and it gives people an opportunity to love on you. If folks are going through it, please love on them. Be God's love manifested to them. When Gloria was sharing recently about a relative going through it, we all prayed with her and she was standing and they loved. They didn't, in fact, it drew the family closer together. But I challenge you, why can't we just get closer together before the death element where we all, suddenly everyone's nicey-nicey. Let's get nicey-nicey now. Let's get it together. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. that's my word. Yes. Real, I mean, genuinely, yes. though. Yes. And I said, when. I hate to say the word when. People say, well, that's faithless. No, if we're on this earth, stuff's going to happen. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. God has given us his peace, his peace, his shalom, his shalom, his completeness. Amen? So when curveballs are thrown at us, choose not to play the blame game. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame anyone else. Don't be bitter. Say, Lord, I want to, how are you going to cause your glory to be seen in this? I want to be better. 
I choose to allow your purpose to be manifest through me, oh God. I choose to rest in your love. And I choose to share my journey with friends and family. I have a group of folks I've reconnected with relatives who I didn't know had gone through something similar, but they hadn't told me. They weathered the storm alone for different reasons. And um, wow. Wow. Your story's not yet finished, saints. This is story time. How are you and I going to walk that path? How are we going to journey through that? I challenge you not to let the curveballs throw you today. Amen? Amen. Lord, I thank you, Father. I thank you that you are with us. I thank you, Lord, you never leave or forsake us, oh God. I thank you that your love and your glory can be seen through us. I thank you, Lord, that you've redeemed us, Father. You've brought restoration to us in every way, Lord. Let it be manifest in and through us, oh God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the young woman in our congregation, Father, who it didn't go the way she planned, Lord, and, and she is a living miracle of the blessing of God, and she now has a, uh, a YouTube thing that she's going to encourage others. We thank you, Father. Some will say she made lemons, lemonade out of lemons, Lord, but I thank you, Father, that curveball did not stop her in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that we see it as you see it, Father. And Lord, thank you that we'll be there one for another. Even you in the garden, Lord, in your humanity said, could you not pray with me one hour? You don't want to be alone. Lord, help us not to be alone. Help us to share and help others be sensitive, not to just say the right words, but just to hug and love us and cry with us and pray with us and laugh with us and journey with us. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for those on live stream, Father. I pray that that person overcoming rheumatoid arthritis, Lord, that you be with them, Father, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, And as she partners with you, Oh, God, I just thank you that you give her good days, Father, that you help her from the inside out in Jesus' name. I thank you for anyone dealing with a mental issue, a physical issue, an emotional issue, or anything, Father, any curveball, a financial thing, a relationship issue, God. We thank you, Lord, right now. We allow you and surrender to you working in the midst of that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. For you are a good God who never leaves us or forsakes us, O God. You are always there with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you on live stream, I pray this word really minister encouragement to you. I felt like being vulnerable. I've been more vulnerable since I've been going through this. But I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me because I'm the healed and I'm just going to walk this journey and meet more people. And hopefully there are little people I can see eye to eye with. (laughs) Be blessed as you go. See you next week. (laughs) 